Welcome to the premiere episode of Picture Lock, a film review show in which we'll take an in-depth look at new releases, classic films in our Master Lock segment, and do a Q&A with the local filmmaker. I'm your host, Kevin Sampson, and it's my intention to entertain the everyday moviegoer while engaging the cinema addict as well. My co-host for today is WTOP critic, film critic Jason Fraley. <laughs> Jason, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. As moviegoers, sometimes we shout at the screen because we know what's going to happen in the film. Today, we take a look at a couple of films that keep us on the edge of our seats, regardless of the fact that we know the outcome. We'll review 2012's Argo and 1976's All the President's Men. And we'll also talk to DC native and indie film director Schwabe Mitchell about his new feature film, Nocturnal Agony. All ahead on Picture Lock. Canadian ambassador's house. We got revolutionary guards going door to door. These people die. They die badly. White House? Who wants the six of them out? What we like for this are bicycles. Deliver the six bikes, provide them with maps. Or you could just send in training wheels and meet them at the border with Gatorade. It's gonna take a miracle to get them out. Looking to score Oscar gold days from now, director Ben Affleck gives us a suspenseful look into the real life events in which Tony Mendez, a CIA operative, led the rescue of six U.S. diplomats from Tehran, Iran during the 1979 Iran hostage crisis. This film has been nominated for 63 awards and has already won 46 of those. With the Oscars around the corner, Jason, there's an obvious question, but I, I'm not going to pose that to you right now. Instead, what I ask you is, what is it about this story that has critics and moviegoers alike just going crazy? Well, I think part of the reason why Hollywood, especially as the Oscars approach, why Hollywood is so enamored by it is that it really celebrates Hollywood imagination. Uh, you know, we have Hollywood working with the CIA to do this exfiltration of these uh, American hostages out of Tehran. And uh, the very fact that, that Hollywood imagination and, and a fake movie, a fake script, is, and a location scout is going to free these guys, um, I think it makes Hollywood feel good about itself. Uh, <laughs> I really do. I really do. A little um, pat on the back? A little pat on the back. Well, that, and that's what Oscar season's all about, right? Right, right. Um, and, and on the other side, uh, and, and for average people, too, I think uh, it, makes, it makes you just feel good about, about Washington, um, which is, you know, in the political gridlock of today and, uh, you know, CIA portray scandals and things. It's nice to see Washington and Hollywood come together and, and pull off something pretty exciting and, and, and patriotic. Right, yeah, definitely. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the story. Um, you know, uh, the basic story uh, and premise uh, of what's going on in, in, in the film. Um, so you have uh, Ben Affleck directing himself, right, as Tony Mendez. Right. Um, uh, he's like this secret CIA agent guy and... Uh, secret he, agent man. Yeah, exactly. And um, so uh, he... I actually kind of enjoyed the the setup for uh, how he actually comes up with the idea of getting these six hostages out of Iran, right? So uh, it, it's it's a great setup in terms of uh, setting up his character. We see that you know he's a father. Um, he's obviously not with his son. He has to make a phone call. He calls his son, and they watch TV together over the phone. Right. One of the Planet of the Apes sequels. Yeah. Well, <laughs> he's sitting there on the phone uh, watching it with his son and realizes that. Uh, as he's staring at the the makeup artists of of the apes in that movie, um, it kind of dawns on him as, hey, this is how we're going to get him out. You know, they they'd gone through a litany of a list of uh, of other ways that his his CIA um, 
fellow operatives ha had suggested and, and the movie idea dawns on him. And, and what, what sounds like, you know, too good to be true uh, of a story, I think that's part of part of why it's such an engrossing movie is that we, if you know, if, if this was a totally fictional idea, we would dismiss it and laugh it off the screen. But knowing that it's true, we can totally sink our teeth into it and, and really follow along. And uh, it's, it's extremely compelling. I mean, the, in the ending, he has this right where he wants us. Uh, we have a parallel action thing going on <laughs> where it's, right. again, you mentioned the phone call with the sun. Well, yeah. here, here we have, uh, they're trying to get through Iranian the, this airport security um, to get on the plane. And we're, and we're intercutting that with uh, them trying to call to confirm it with, with the, the fictional uh, Hollywood studio with John Goodman and Alan Arkin back in, in L.A. Um, and as we're cutting back and forth between these two, uh, you know, we, if you're familiar with the real life story, you know what's going to happen. But I was sitting there on the edge of my seat. I, I haven't been that... Uh, grip to find out what happened, you know, <laughs> waiting for a plane to take off since Casablanca, you know, with the, with the <laughs> right. exit visas and everything. Um, <laughs> right. And, and, you know, I don't, Argo probably won't be up in, in that upper, upper echelon, but, but it will join the conversation of, of great movies just because the way it, it plays our emotions like that. And the and parallel action I haven't seen done better than that in any movie in, in you know, quite some time. So. Right, right. And, and, I mean, we obviously have to give it credit. Uh, obviously, um, this award season, uh, it's just been, you know, on a, on a sweep, just picking up everything. Um, but we kind of did talk about um, just the way that the parallel action goes and just like uh, the screenwriting, uh, Chris Terrio, he just did a phenomenal job. There's not really too much fat in the film, you know, every frame right. kind of just pushes the film forward. Um, which is where I think it, which is where I think maybe why down the stretch it's kind of turned the tables on Lincoln a little bit because I, I mean I've seen them both three times and I love them both, um, but I'm thinking maybe Argo's starting to get the push a because it has the underdog factor you know Lincoln got the most nominations with twelve and and Ben got snubbed for director and all that right um, but part of the other reason is it's like you're saying there's no fat on it it's kind of tighter. Um, I, you know, Lincoln, I think, ends, uh, I think it could have ended with, with his long, slow walk down the hallway uh, to go to the carriage to, to Ford's Theater. You know, I, I'd, I'd love to stay, but I can't. <laughs> you uh, know, I like your remix, though, because, I mean, that, that, that would be a perfect ending. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's so, but, but bring you back to Argo, it's, you know, Argo, it's, it, there's not an ounce of wasted, wasted space in the movie. It, it's so tightly done. Every scene is there for a reason. And, uh, you know, depending on taste, you might link Lincoln better than Argo or vice versa, but uh, Argo, I think, is probably a little more accessible to more people, which is probably why it's getting the, the bump. Right, definitely. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about the directing uh, and go into, you know, Affleck again, he's directing himself, um, but this has been Affleck's third feature um, after Gone Baby Gone uh, in the town. Uh, there are plenty of directors that just because of their name is attached, right? Uh, we probably want to check out the movie. There's Scorsese, uh, Spielberg, Spike, Christopher Nolan, James Cameron, the Coen brothers, etc. You know, um, but do you think that Ben Affleck is now placing himself with those directors? With I mean, I mean, he's had three solid films now, and obviously this this third and you know his most recent is really getting critical acclaim. Yeah, uh, I, th I mean, I think he's definitely he's got a ways to go to be put in a class with Scorsese <laughs> and the likes of them. Uh -huh. um, but but yeah, I mean, we're I think we're starting to see a guy who's actually you know arguably more talented as a, a filmmaker and a storyteller because let's not let's not forget he also co-wrote uh the oscar-winning script for goodwill hunting so right. you take that and the films he's directed most recently argo which i think is his best directorial efforts to date um i think he's starting to become a, a better storyteller slash filmmaker than he is actual actor not bad as an actor <laughs> but you know not I, you know, i'd say rather average actor versus a, a really rising you know presence as a director um, some of the things that I see he does in, in Argo that maybe, you, you know, you, you miss the first time you watch it. The first time we're watching a movie, you know, it's, it's a thrill ride. Uh, you know, Argo, we're on the edge of our seat. Right. Uh, but what I think makes the great movies and the ones that do well the awards is when you come back and you watch them, you know, multiple times and find cool direct, directing techniques. Right, right. Um, we already mentioned the parallel action. Um, there's a couple cool transitions that I noticed uh, where Affleck will spin a ball on a table and then it'll cut to a spinning record of Led Zeppelin playing a, a when the levee breaks. All right. But, uh, and then uh, another cool thing I noticed uh, was the, the scene you mentioned with the, when, he, when he calls his son to talk about the, uh, the Planet of the Apes movie where he gets the idea to, to do the X-Fill. Right. Um, 
you'll notice the, 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 he could have set it up however where the son answers the phone in any way. The son could have been laying next to it and picked it up. You know, that, that's what the director does. They do the blocking. Right. And instead, he shows the phone in front of a railing, which is almost like a jail bars, and the son comes up over it, reaches <laughs> over the jail bars to answer the phone, and it's almost like, all right, we're going to exfil, Dad. So, you know, it, we're, we're bringing these guys out of the, out of the imprisoned uh, trap there in, in Tehran. Um, there's some really sweet camera moves through the CIA headquarters, um, right. which we'll talk about more when we get to all the president's <laughs> men. Um, yeah. But there's a lot of cool directing things going on. And, and also, um, uh, one final thing I noticed was when they're, when they're driving through the, the van, when they're in the van driving through the, um, the market to do their location scout, their fake location scout, you'll notice that all, a lot of the... The, the shots of the other characters in the van who are pretending to be the producers and the writers and the crew of this yeah. fake movie, uh, the hands, the, 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 it's always handheld on them. It, it's shaky as, as, as um, Iranian citizens are pounding on the windows. And, uh, and, but you'll notice that every shot of Aflac in the driver's seat is like a lockdown shot from like one of those waiter, waiter trays looking straight at him. Right. And I think it's almost, it kind of shows he's the calm presence in the storm while the rest of them are jittery and, you know, noticing the people pounding on the windows. Aflac is just smooth, cool, calm, and collected. And, and that's just the kind of directing stuff that, that works on you subconsciously. Yeah. But, uh, I think that's, but that's part of why we enjoy the movie, and that's kind of like the art of the film language. Yeah, definitely, and I, I think also, uh, you know, TV is a big thing, right? So, uh, we live in a day and age now where we get our news like on our cell phones. Back then, in, in the '70s, you know, we're right. getting the the news from uh, actual TV. I think, uh, you know. Obviously, uh, I don't think we were around in the 70s, but my mother said that, uh, you know... We uh, were a thought. Yeah, we were <laughs> a distant thought. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she said that, I think it was because of the uh, hostage crisis that, uh, was it uh, Nightline was created? So, uh, okay. you know, at that time, we didn't have our 24-7. Right. Uh, exactly. exactly. Yeah. But uh, within the film, we see where the TV is such a big uh, integral part, right? So they're watching uh, the news as it unfolds uh, in CIA headquarters and you know back in America and then we cut to uh, the news cameras that are actually covering the Iranian women as they're talking about you know um, how you know we want right. justice etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah I think I think he does a great job of incorporating that that you know archival footage um, you know one minute we'll see a, a fictionalized, you know, written screenplay scene with Affleck and other actors, Tate Donovan and whoever. Um, and then seamlessly we're cutting all of a sudden with Tom Brokaw and Peter Jennings and watching that actual news footage. And a lot of times it's hard to tell, you know, what was staged and what wasn't, especially in the, the opening scene where the, uh, the American embassy in Tehran is, is stormed. Um, right. I don't know anyone that, that watched that that... I mean, I, it came out a month after the attack in, in Benghazi that killed the, you know, Chris Stevens and other three other Americans. Um, and I, I was sitting there in, in the, the screening of Argo, and, and it was just rushing. I was like, well, this must have been what it felt like. Right. So it just felt like, I think that's part of why it's also rising, too, is that it's, in the, in the Oscar buzz, is that it's just this, it's almost like it caught the zeitgeist, you know what I mean? Like, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it was a movie for its time, and, uh, you know, when you make a movie, you try to make it relevant, but you have no idea that Benghazi's going to happen, and then, boom, there it happens in, in Libya, and we watch it unfold on screen at, at the theater. So right. it's, I think that's part of the power of it. Yeah, definitely. And, I mean, you kind of talked about uh, the, the pacing. So this is a suspense thriller, right? And, I, again, it's amazing that we know the outcome, but, like, I'm right. holding my breath. So uh, so part of it was his pacing, right? right? So we're, we're, we're on edge, uh, you know, like we said, when, uh, you know, they're storming. Um, but then he also takes a moment to slow it down. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about um, the characters because uh, we have, Alan Arkin and uh, John Goodman. These guys are the comic relief, right? So this is already a tense, uh, emotional uh, state that everybody's in, but right. we cut out the Hollywood uh, and, you know, the lavishness of it all. Um, but let's just talk a little bit about the characters. Yeah, uh, it's... It's. I'm pretty sure it's. It's. It's pretty much uh, a great mix. It's that rare mix, actually, right. where you get nail-biting thriller with what's going on in Iran, with this really kind of you know side-splitting comedy. Uh, the trademark of the movie, which I won't say here, because it's <laughs> right, fame, right. But it's like this year's Fubar. You know, in Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> right. Uh, Argo. You know, blank yourself. And yeah. It's, and and that's the kind of comedy we cut back to over and over again. Right. Um. And 
it's just special when a movie can do that. And and both of those guys, uh, Alan Arkin's obviously up for Best Supporting Actor, um, which he won a couple years ago for Little Miss Sunshine. Yeah. Um, John Goodman I, isn't nominated, but my, I mean, they're, they're, they're both equally, I mean, how do you choose between them? But the cool thing about John Goodman's character is uh, I actually went after the movie. Uh, he plays the, the special effects, Oscar winning special effects guy of who did the Planet of the Apes, yep. Chambers. And uh, if you go back in IMDb, his, uh, his credits, you'll notice that Chambers from like 1977 to 1980, there's just a gap where he wasn't doing anything. So if you watch Argo, you know what he was doing. Right, he was, he was, right. He was a spy with the CIA. Yeah. Um, and so there's just these great larger than life roles, but it actually happened. And um, th they provide just a comic relief that you don't find in, you know, I was, I think I watched Denzel's Safe House like a couple of days before, just <laughs> right. out of chance, and it's just no comparison. Yeah. So uh, there's, there's no, there's yeah. not much comedy in that. No, no, and and the the and the action's not done nearly as well either. So it's it's just a good balance, and I think again that's why it's doing well at the Oscars. There's a little something for everybody. Exactly, and I think that you know we know that when we deal with death, right. You know, that's a serious topic, but being able to, you know, have a little laugh, right. you know what I'm saying, the comedy, you think about uh, films like uh, Butch Cassidy's Sundance Kid, okay. you know, it, you got to kind of laugh in the face of death, yeah. right? And Who so, are and these the, guys? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> this is a serious situation, but these guys really add a lot of comedy. So, uh, really quickly, just uh, visually, you know, how does uh, Argo keep us on the edge of our seats? Uh, well, I mean, some of these are the directing techniques we already mentioned, right. uh, you know, the shaky cam in the car versus the steady cam on Aflac. That's a visual subconscious thing. Um, the parallel action and cutting back and forth um, as the as the police cars are zipping down the uh, runway after the plane. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, these, these are the visual things that, that we're talking about that, that really keeps us on the edge. Right, definitely. And, I mean, if you notice, he just has a, a, a good fluidity with the camera. Uh, I think a lot of times we're in close. Uh, when, when many films might just give us a wide shot, we're, we're, we're kind of like in mediums or close-ups, mm -hmm. and it, it's, it really is kind of claustrophobic. You know, it yep. just adds more to that tension. We're, we're really seeing uh, the yeah. actor's face. And um, I think he does a good job, too, of juxtaposing different images that we wouldn't think like uh, I believe when when Affleck first arrives to Tehran we get as he, we basically see his POV looking out of various windows in the van he'll look to one side and we see a bunch of people eating Kentucky Fried Chicken which is right. like the modern you know Mick world we live in yeah you look out the other side and there's a guy hanging literally by his neck from a crane right um, so it's almost like the the, the forward-looking Western world with KFC versus the you know, kind of the, the backward world of that. And uh, that's just boom, boom, two images, but says a lot. Yeah. And you also see the Ayatollah uh, Khomeini in the background a lot with the what film geeks would call mise-en-scene, which is basically just a fancy French word for everything in the frame having significant, significant importance. Right. Um, but with the Ayatollah there, it's almost like he's constantly watching over him. Yeah, definitely. Um, and real quick. So that adds uh, to it. Before we, we jump to a break and start to get into all the president's men, um, I, one thing I have to bring up is uh, the issue uh, in terms of the suspense, right? He, have to, he has to build up the fear. Right. Um, but I feel as though, uh, and I've heard a lot of uh, critics that have talked about this, but uh, Affleck plays on our fear in uh, sort of a xenophobia Hollywood manner, right? The fear of uh, people from another country. Right. So, uh, you know, the Iranians are turned into these villains that we can't understand their language, right? Right. So he purposely doesn't put subtitles. Right. Uh, what do you think about that? Just in terms of, I mean, that's kind of sometimes that's what Hollywood does. And I, I, right. I don't necessarily think it, it's a good thing. Uh, I definitely understand that, you know, at the time, if they stepped outside, they would have gotten shot. Right. right. But uh, at the same time, like, where do we draw the line? Because we know that obviously, you know, uh, and not spoiler alert, uh, you know, the whole chasing at the end, that right. didn't happen. They got out, like, scot-free. Right. So, you and know, where do we draw the yeah. yeah, yeah, where do we draw the line with that? Well, I mean, it's definitely a fair point. Um, uh, you know, especially if you were an Iranian watching it, I'm sure you'd take a different thing from it, totally. Um, yeah, what you're saying is fair in terms of when, you know, when they're, like the scene I mentioned where they're beating up against the van, it almost seems like there's this unknown outsider that's coming to get us. So uh, right. there's a little of that. Um, in, in Ben's defense, uh, I think, I think he, there are points where he goes out of the way to try to, to counteract that a little bit because he knows that these are his villains in his movie. So I think there's points where he goes out of the way with the, the archival footage that we're talking about um, where there'll be news interviews of 
of the Iranian students who staged the revolt, say, you know, saying our rights are being trampled, and and this is really just more of the you know the great Satan that put in the Shah, which we see in the comic book strip in the opening of the movie. Um, and then there's also some some stage clips of uh, some uh, more radical. Uh, views it's kind of like a redneck character on the news remember saying you know down with down with the irans why don't we just take them out and shoot them you know but right. they're, they're not painting painted in a good light those are those are seeming like extremes on our end yeah so i think ben does try to balance it a little bit and which is may, probably why the film gets a pass on the other stuff and is still rising the oscar ranks which you know hollywood's still a pretty liberal place so yeah, i mean it's and, it's and it's you know it hasn't been enough of a of a factor to deter it so yeah, well, uh, overall, uh, Argo is an awesome film. Uh, you know, if you get a chance, definitely want to check it out in theaters. Um, let's take a quick break, and we'll come back, and we'll talk about all the president's men. Sounds good. <laughs> There's been a break in at Democratic headquarters. They were bugging the place. Woodward, Bernstein, you're both on the story now. Don't get up. Redford. I'm Bob Woodward of the Washington Post. Mr. Markham, are you here in connection with the Watergate burglary? I'm not here. Hoffman. Hi, uh, this is Carl Bernstein of the Washington Post, and I was just wondering if you can remember... All the President's Men. The story of the two young reporters who cracked the Watergate conspiracy. White House. Howard Hunt, please. He might be in Mr. Colson's office. Who's Charles Colson? Did you know uh, Howard Hunt? Well, the White House said he was doing some investigative work. What do you say? They stumbled into Leeds. Certainly it comes as no surprise to you that Howard was with the CIA. No, no surprise at all. They tripped over clues. We'd like to see all the material requested by the White House. All White House transactions are confidential. This whole thing is a cover-up. It's right on our nose. And piece by piece, they solve the greatest detective story in American history. Looking at the trailer for All the President's Men with 2013 goggles, uh, it seems like it could be a pretty boring film. Uh, of course, trailers were cut different 40 years ago than they are in the fast-paced world of today. Um, the tie into today's classic film shouldn't be too hard to find. I think it's fair to say that this film pushed plenty of college students into the doors of journalism schools. Uh, the film is based on the book of the same name written by Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein um, that documented uh, their journey in eventually uh, exposing Richard Nixon's Watergate scandal. Yeah, uh, Kevin, it's not, While the President's Men isn't just a great journalism movie, which it is, and which even when I was in journalism school back in undergraduate, um, it, it's like the gospel, these two guys. Um, and actually, uh, Carl Bernstein actually spoke at our graduation over here. Really? Maryland. Yeah, so it was wow. pretty cool. Uh, so I have a special place in my heart for these these guys. <laughs> but not only is it just that a good you know journalism movie, um, it's also just a great buddy flick. Uh, you know, in the great tradition of buddy movies. Right. Uh, and and Red, they f picked a good one with Redford because uh. you mentioned Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid earlier. Right. You know. You, you like how I did that, right? I don't know if you knew I was going there, but you did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that that was Redford and Paul Newman, and then they did they they did it again with The Sting. Right. But here you get Robert Redford as Woodward and Carl Bernstein as, or uh, <laughs> Dustin sorry. Hoffman. Dustin Hoffman, yeah. And Carl Bernstein. Yeah. You know what I mean? I know what you're talking about. Um, and they just play off each other so well. Uh, particularly the scene where they they think the house is bugged and. Redford just turns up a bunch of music and they go and sit at a typewriter and right. they can't talk but just ver they can't use verbal communication but they sit down at a typewriter and say I think we're being watched we have to communicate on here and just the way they go back and forth and in their interviews interrogating people and getting trying to get the details out of the various Nixon aides and family members of the aides it's just a, it's 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 a cool mystery it's a cool journalism story it's a cool buddy flick and right. it, it's a whole it's every genre really yeah you know I love how you say that it's a buddy flick we have uh you know it's fair to say you know uh handsome uh robert redford you know back in the day you know brother's gotten a little old now but uh back in the day you know this right. uh, the ladies the loved stud him. of the 70s, right yeah. right he was the stud was the Brad Pitt uh, of that day yeah. He, yeah but you know what i loved about uh some of like we talked about with argo um just crowding the frame so a lot of frames that you see with robert Red redford you see uh books piled up on his desk right so uh he's supposed to be like the handsome guy but yet at the same time like he's kind of unkempt you know right but then we have uh hoffman who is kind of like more the seasoned right. uh journalist uh, you know, you, you had the 
that infamous scene, and and, and I like uh, how they kind of start their relationship, right. in which uh, Hoffman grabs, you know, uh, the thing that. Redford Redford's just writing. Yeah, exactly. He he had just printed it out, and then he starts typing on it. He's like, "Look, I don't care the fact that you did it. It's the, you know how you did it." And so from there, we ha we see this like love hate relationship, mm -hmm. you know. But they actually work together, and it, it's like you said, it's like a buddy film, but at the same time, you know, it's a mystery, uh, a suspense thriller. And it's almost like a little mini competition between them, you know. Right. <laughs> but it pushes each other to do be better and better, and it, and together, you know, rising tide raises all boats. And they're, you know, they go from measly, you know, Metro reporters or whatever they are at the start. And to the end, they take down the president of the United States and change the history of the world. These two guys typing away on their computers in the background. You know, right. they, they show Nixon's uh, inaug second inaugural address on the TV, but back in the background, Wood Jordan and Bernstein are there typing away. And those are, the, the, it's a different type of hero, um, but it really kind of glamorizes, uh, I think, what good inge investigative journalism is. You know, yeah. We've seen, there's definitely lots of bad, you know, sensationalized yellow journalism. You know, you have the, the Citizen Kane, over, you know, journalism. <laughs> right. But this is like ex investigative journalism as it should be done. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, again, we're talking about uh, the, the 70s here, right? So it's not, right. you know, computers, like you said, it's type typewriters. Um, they actually had to get out and go somewhere. You know, you can make right. a phone call, but you actually had to go to the library. The library of Congress. <laughs> right, <laughs> to look it right. up, and you got that infamous shot where they go up to the top. Right, and, you know. Right. Um, um, uh, so I thought it was awesome uh, in terms of like the tie-in to Argo. You know, they're both uh, in in the seventies, um, but uh, with uh, all the president's men, um, I think that Affleck had to have watched that film before you know he started directing Argo because I mean we talked to, you talked a little bit about um, just some of the camera moves and right. uh, we alluded to it earlier, but um, just in terms of how. Uh, you know, sometimes either we're moving with them, right, mm -hmm. through, uh, you know, the, the news uh, building mm -hmm. and everything, yep, uh, and then sometimes it's actually locked off, like there's a, a nice scene, uh, and I mean, this is, this is why this is a master lock, you know, film, right. uh, <laughs> where it's a six minute one take, single take, yeah. single take of uh, Redford, and uh, he's just on the phone, right? And then in the background, we have like you know uh, the rest of the newsroom, um, and they all crowd around the TV because right. you know something's going on, right. and they're making noise, but yet he's the only one working, yeah. you know, again with his books yeah. and everything. But we slowly just push right. in, just barely so, notice it, exactly, yeah. uh, just to kind of like engage. You know the viewer as as yeah. you're watching, you're just like, oh my goodness! Like, who cares what's going on in the background? It could be World War Three, but you know, uh, we're, we're so engaged. So let's talk a little bit about some of those uh, different techniques as well that we see in all the President's Men that I think were also Translate used in to, exactly to Argo. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I you, I think, I think Affleck definitely had to sit down and watch it. I mean, I think he knew he was making '70s political thriller uh, with CIA involvement. He, this is like this must have been like a handbook to him, I think. And right. It's there from the opening of Argo. You, you'll notice that Argo. You know, the, the opening credits, they show the different studios. They show the old school 70s Warner Brothers logo at <laughs> yeah. the beginning of Argo. Yeah, the red that's and true. black. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so from right right off the bat, we know it feels like we're watching a movie from, from that era, which was a great era. From, right, you know, right, right. 67 to like 80 is like some of the best American movies ever made. Um, don't get me started, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, and I think I think he used it as as pretty much like a blueprint. Um, you'll even see some of the the art direction in Argo. Um, you'll note the the CIA headquarter buildings. It's got those big uh, fluorescent lights above on the ceiling, right. which is just enlightening the whole space. And that looks exactly like the newsroom in All the President's Men. Right. Um, some of the camera moves through the newsroom and the CIA headquarters, these, these long dolly tracks through the desks of the various things, um, just following these characters, like kind of cutting through the midst of all these coworkers. Right. Um, there's a lot of parallels. And then also you have the, what you said, it, it, the Redford was kind of the, you know, the scene of like a, a pretty face, kind of like the hunk, you know, that the girls would go crazy <laughs> over. Right. And then th with movies like this, he's starting to prove that he's, he's a legit, you know, right. technical actor too. Right. And you could say Ben Affleck was is kind of the same thing. He had the Benefer phase, you know, where he's, <laughs> you know, dating J Lo. Right, right, right. And another tie-in is that they both went from this, you know, pretty boy actor stigma 
to Sundance directing movies. Right. You know, right. Like Redford was doing Ordinary People four years after All the President's Men, and then you have Affleck, who's now moved from acting to directing. And uh, so I think they're they're just a very good parallel career. Uh, yeah. Maybe Clooney's the only other one I can think of that you know, has made the jump, and he produced. Right. Co-produced Argo. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you know, we talked uh, in Argo about. Uh, how, you know, we know the end of the story, right? right. So uh, this is American history. I'm not a crook. Even I know to say right. that, and I wasn't, you know, born right. or around at that time. Yeah. And uh, you know not to say it, too. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, let, let, let's talk a little bit like we did uh, with Argo in sure. terms of how, uh, what is it that makes that film successful right. where, you know, we, we, even though we watch it and we know the ending, right. uh, it's still, like, engaging. It's true. We, uh, everyone knows, everyone knew that, Nixon resigned and, right. and when the movie came out it was like two years after he had resigned yeah so which to me is why I think uh, which is probably why they ended the film the way they do um, when I try to show this to some other people my age colleague you know colleagues uh, the one just average viewers too not like cinephiles like ex expert people um, their one complaint is always that it, it kind of rushes through the very end it shows a right. long detailed journey and then yeah. they use the teletype to just rattle off the uh, <laughs> headlines at the end yeah. you know they, they ran out they, of they the find budget the, they find yeah budget well, <laughs> no i doubt that it's definitely seems intentional obviously right, right but um you know the part with the the tapes they find the tape the, the you know deleted tapes and the fact that nixon resigns uh, uh that's the complaint I always hear, but you got to think of it, about it in 76. That was what everyone had put, seen plastered all over the news. They knew that part of the story. Right. But the, the journey there from measly reporter to, you know, these award-winning journalists um, is kind of the, the meat of the journey. Uh, and I think the way they keep it interesting, despite knowing, we know how it ends, but I think they just keep it interesting by showing us all the cool journalism techniques you know I, yeah. i'm gonna stay on the phone and, and, and if i count if i get to 10 then it's a co confirmation of the source or yeah yeah you know things like that right um, definitely or, and he's writing notes on his napkins and jittered on coffee and right so let's talk about yeah. that though uh I, I think that also helps with the pacing of mm -hmm. the film right so uh there's so many times where uh, uh redford and hoffman they're going to talk to uh, a potential source right right and as they do it they slow down their pace, mm -hmm. you know, um, they're trying to be sensitive to the situation mm -hmm. uh, and they ask their questions clearly and articulately, yeah. right? And then as soon as they get back, they're like, you know, like yeah. you said, he's pulling out notes. Yeah. He can't find enough notes. Where did I put the other piece <laughs> yeah, of, you yeah. know? And uh, it just, it's funny how they just take you on that ride where you're like, oh my goodness, you know? And then all of a sudden, like you're, yeah, 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 yeah. Like trying to piece uh, everything yeah. together. So I think the pacing parallels between the two films you know, it's definitely there. Yeah, like, you know, we said in Argo, it's, uh, you know, you have the comic relief back right. in there where it slows down and then the, you know, rapid fire uh, thriller part and then All the President's Men is the same way for for the reason you said. I mean, it's there, when, when you're interviewing someone, you're going to want to slow it down. You want to sound professional. You don't want to spook them. They, these people yeah. are under enough stress. They, I mean, at this point, they're thinking their lives are in danger and their, you know, every, their house is bugged. <laughs> right. So why are they going to reveal stuff unless you come at them calmly and, you know. Um, but then when it's back in the, in the newsroom or in their apartment on the typewriters, it's slide it over type, slide it over type. Right, here's right. my napkin. Here's, here's my notes on this napkin. So... Um, I, yeah, I think I think in any movie you want that those peaks and valleys. You want to be in, engaged on the edge of your seat, and then you need to relax because if it's just constantly, you know, it's it's a, a tiresome. So right, definitely, and uh, you know, in all the president's men, we're introduced to the infamous deep throat character. <laughs> uh, so you know, it's uh, and actually, it's it's funny. You know, we're right here in Arlington, and uh, right. apparently, the garage that they met in was actually in Roslyn. So, uh, you know, again, uh, a film that's uh, close to the D.C., you know, metro area. Um, but obviously, like with the Deep Throat character, it adds a, a lot of suspense, you know. Um, right. and, and like you said, even uh, the character and how Redford interacts with the, the character brings a little gravitas to uh, the film. And, you know, with uh, Redford, that, that infamous scene where he comes into... Uh, you know, uh, Bernstein's house mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, sh but, you know, 
you see that film that that again in the firm right with yeah. uh, Tom Cruise right. later where he does the same thing with his right. wife it's amazing and right. then of course we have the Tom Cruise running cuz right. just side note Tom Cruise runs in every single movie <laughs> uh, everybody <laughs> runs as they said in minority report <laughs> right exactly um, but yeah these are just some of those uh, great uh, cinematic you know characters and the lighting I love well you mentioned deep throw how he's in the yeah. garage he's always in the shadow the first time we see him uh, it's just you see legs in a, uh, sticking out of a shadow, but then you see a, a cigarette lighter go off. So it's just like a little flash of, of red in this shadow. Right. And it yeah. just makes him a really mysterious character saying, you know, follow the money and, and giving <laughs> these little clues. Um, and to the point where at one point they, they think they're being watched and he just ups and vanishes. We see Redford's POV and he's and right, he throws throat's gone. It was like Batman, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, as, and actually as Redford's leaving the garage and he's walking down the street, the camera's like, actually like it's following him. right and all of a sudden it's a quick zoom in and he turns around like with a gasp and no one's there right so it's there's some great the, the director is uh, a guy named um alan j pacula uh yeah. who he actually produced uh to kill a mockingbird right and pelican pretty, brief as well yeah later on yeah. and he he uh, wrote and directed uh sophie's choice yeah so he's, he's definitely he's made some good ones uh, again he's not in like the upper echelons with like the scorsese's we're talking about right but someone maybe that affleck sees himself as in that vein you know right and i know you and i were talking about this the other day just in terms of like even with hitchcock right so he was poo-pooed in his time right. like you know whatever just but, a cheap thriller guy yeah. right exactly but these are guys that like really know their genre you know they're really able to set that up and i think in the same way you know affleck he really knows his genre these uh slow quiet you know right. suspenseful right. uh films and now hitchcock is the the darling of the art academic film community right right so I th and I think he, I think uh, I think that's why he, he'll go down as the best on this on an entertainment superficial level of the, the that side of the film spectrum you know he's he's the master of suspense and, and a showman and you know good evening and, uh, and then on the <laughs> other end it, he's this great artistic director where you can go back and look at all of the cool uh, elements to you know vertigo rear window I, we can't, that's a whole nother show but, right but yeah I think and, and bring it back to Argo and and all the presidents men I think the reason they're both so successful is they master that art, uh, s real skill technique um, with the, just an entertaining thrill ride. You know, people are going to go to the theater and see Argo and think, that was a great movie. I laughed my butt off and I was <laughs> on the edge of my seat and I have no nails left because I was biting my nails. <laughs> right. They're going to see it a third time when they go bring their buddies and then they'll notice cool stuff. Like, yeah. Like we were talking about earlier. Yeah, definitely. And that's a great movie. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Jason, uh, appreciate you uh, just going through these uh, Argo and all the President's Men. It was a blast. Uh, yeah, it's been great. Uh, we're going to take a quick uh, break. Again, welcome to the premiere episode of Picture Lock, where we focus on film. In the last segment of the show, I'll sit down with a local filmmaker to the DMV area and chat about their latest film and hopefully give an in-depth uh, insight as to the process of filmmaking from their point of view. My next guest is a DC native with many hats. Shweb Mitchell is a director, writer, and producer. His new faith-based feature, Nocturnal Agony, is loosely based on his own life. Shweb, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for uh, coming on. Uh, before we get into uh, Nocturnal Agony, uh, I always like to start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, how did you get in the business? I know you actually started out at C-SPAN. You were directing uh, uh, live call-in shows. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 92, you actually directed your uh, first uh, hour-long uh, documentary, Straight Up Go-Go, which is actually playing at the historic Lincoln Theater this weekend, That's correct? correct? That's correct. All yeah. right, so just uh, tell me a little bit about the, the, the entrance. Well, my, my career actually began at Howard University. I okay. cannot leave out the university. <laughs> I studied film and television production at Howard uh, on the uh, outstanding, uh, renowned uh, faculty that included Holly Garima um, and Abby Ford, many of a renowned, uh, and, and I can't forget Alonzo Crawford as well, mm. uh, who taught me the craft. And from there, I was fortunate enough to get my first job, as you mentioned, out of, of college. I believe uh, I was fortunate to begin working like a week after graduation. Wow. <laughs> really fortunate. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, to come out and uh, I started at C-SPAN where um, I cut my teeth, if you will. <laughs> Learned everything I could about the television business. It was a very uh, um, good job for, for someone just coming into the business. Mm -hmm. And um, after my third year, I began directing the nightly call-in shows, the live call-in shows, okay. as well as the Sunday 
afternoon or evening shows as well. Uh, I believe a show they still have one called Book Review. Okay. Um, while at C-SPAN, um, a group of um, Howard graduates, myself, uh, Sawandi Tachow now and Fred Brown Jr., decided to form a partnership and we formed a company uh, by the name of Progressive Productions. And out of that derived our first film, a documentary film which I produced and directed um, called Straight Up Go-Go. Okay. And uh, as you just mentioned, that film uh, was produced in 92. Um, it uh, later was released by uh, ATA Trading Corp, which released it internationally. It aired on PBS um, and went throughout the festival circuit, did fairly well. Um, and that film to this day is still being, um, and we're just fortunate to be, um, it's still being asked for, if you will. Right. Um, the film will screen this Friday at the Historic Lincoln Theater as part of their Black History Month program. Right. And obviously, uh, you know, D.C., you grew up in D.C., you, you know, as you said, you went to Howard. Yes. Go-Go uh, Music, you know, you mm. know, that's DMV right there. No question. <laughs> uh, so I, it's obvious that you do tell, t tell tales mm. uh, that involve uh, the D.C. area. So I, I can tell you have uh, definitely a love for for the area um, and moving into to your next film 2007 mm. Two Saved which you can check out on uh, Netflix right That's now right. I saw yeah. that last night <laughs> 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 tell yeah. us a little bit about that I know it's a crazy story in terms of actually shooting it getting in the can yeah well well Two Saved began as a stage play it was originally written by my pastor um, Dr. John L. McCoy and um, did fairly well as a, as a stage play we were looking for something well I was in particular he was, in general, looking for something um, because we hadn't done a film since the documentary. We had done a lot of music videos, commercials, uh, work for the various uh, companies that I had been working for, but I hadn't done a, a, a film of my own. And so we wanted to do uh, a film to get back into the marketplace and, and the script to save some like a perfect vehicle to do so. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I took the play and adapted it to the screen, um, and we... Um, casted the film with uh, local um, talent uh, from the New York area as well as DC um, and, and came out with a, a wonderful product. The film, the, the, the thing about the film that was unique that we shot the entire uh, feature film in two days, two and a half days to be, <laughs> to be exact. <laughs> <laughs> How you pull that off? I, I don't know. That has to be a, crazy. A, a lot of, <laughs> of coffee and long <laughs> nights, my brother. I think it was something like 18 hour days on, on wow. certain occasions. But we had, but the thing about that film, it was such a labor of love. The entire cast, um, and this is literal, I mean, are like family today. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the actors who uh, played in uh, To Save also starred in Nocturnal Agony, my uh, current film that we'll talk about later. Um, and we, I attend all of their plays, um, births of children, <laughs> <laughs> little, and they do the same for us. And so we really became like family. It was a family atmosphere. Right. Everyone was there really for the cause of the movie. And so we're able to pull it off because of that. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't have worked. Wow. So, you know, as a uh, up-and-coming directors that mm -hmm. might be watching the, the show, you know, what were some of the things that you learned from that experience um, mm -hmm. that propelled you forward to uh, Nocturnal Agony before we get into that? Well, I, I, one of the major, I mean, a lot of things. It was my first film that I dealt with SAG, mm -hmm. Screen Actors Guild. Mm -hmm. um, red, I, tape, I, red tape, red tape, red <laughs> tape. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Uh, the good thing about it was that with that particular film, the experiences between Two Saved and Nocturnal Agony were night and day mm. because of the budgets. Right. Um, the budget we had for Two Saved was actually around fifteen thousand okay. uh, dollars. Really, the money you have for a short film. Right. Um, and so, SAG didn't really give us much hassle. <laughs> it yeah. Just passed the paperwork through. <laughs> um, we had a, I think, three actors who were uh, members of SAG. Um, none of the unions gave us any problems. None of the Teamsters came around snooping around anything. So mm -hmm. we were able to do true independent uh, a film. Um, right. As I said, the, the cast and crew were most like family, if you will. Nocturnal Agony was a whole different animal. <laughs> that was a Hollywood level type production, and I'm sure we'll talk about that later. But so the things I learned is is is, is basically that. Um, that there's a big difference when you when you begin to increase the budget amounts and we have different stars involved in the product. Um, I also learned um, how to shoot fast, mm. um, and um, and I think the director of photography and I, uh, Parrish Smith, uh, we had worked on a number of projects before, 
And so we came in with, with a plan, able to execute that plan with efficiency and knowing that we have to get in and get out. Uh, unfortunately, some of the very aesthetic shots that I may have wanted, as you can <laughs> yeah. relate to as a director, um, some of the more demanding, time-consuming, <laughs> right. long right. dollies right. And, and cranes could not be used. Yeah. Because, we, again, we had to shoot the film in two days. Okay. But nevertheless, we, it would, I think we um, did a, a good job, obviously, because of the success of the film. People yeah. loved the little movie, and um, that propelled us to where we are today. <clears throat> awesome. Uh, cool. Well, uh, you know, let's go ahead and uh, let's get into uh, the trailer for Nocturnal Agony so we can go ahead and talk about that. I was wondering if you know where Patty is. When you get this message, call me right away. Okay, bye. I had every intention of telling you sooner. The time got away, then after a while, I... You two were doing so well, I didn't want to bring you any problems. Besides, I thought Patty would have told you by now anyway. I'm sorry, son. How did an upper middle class housewife get herself in a predicament like this? every night contemplating where I failed as a parent. Oh, God, you fail no one. Well, why is it happening then? You, know, you can't, you can't believe anything that, that Patty says. I mean, hey, man, she was probably, she was probably high when she said that your daughter's crazy. Satan himself was setting me up. Patty, are you being held hostage? I'm sorry, we couldn't save the baby. I think all my problems began the night my daddy left. Wow. Uh, so, Schwab, uh, you know, we just watched the trailer. Uh, if you could just give us uh, a summary of, uh, you know, what the film is all about. Well, Nocturne Egg is, is uh, near and dear to my heart because it's loosely based on a true story. My right. Own personal story of, of my wife and I, although a lot of the elements are not factual. Mm -hmm. uh, we kind of based it on some of those elements. It's essentially a story of a, a young woman who um, seems to be on the surface very successful, but in reality she's dealing with some very dark demons, mm. uh, demons such as bipolar disorder, addiction, and um, we find out later that she was abused as a child. Mm -hmm. And so her um, drugging, if you will, is a byproduct of these experiences. Mm. And so um, it's one of the, and I, if I may say so, I think it's one of the most um, ambitious uh, films done in Hollywood to deal with these kind of issues. It's the only one I've seen of its kind that truly deals on a very serious level some of the more taboo and unspoken or hidden issues uh, in society today. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, I guess you kind of, if you might talk a little bit, you know, you don't have to go into too much detail, sure. but what it inspired you to write the film? And just like, you know, as filmmakers, we have a, a, a dream, a vision uh, mm -hmm. of what we want to uh, display with our art. Sure. So what, what, what was your thinking behind the process uh, in your writing? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is uh, uh, loosely based on my story. So to be honest with you, Kevin, it was very cathartic. Mm. Um, it was yeah. a very difficult process. And the first few drafts, um, I really wasn't uh, telling a narrative film, a story, if you will. Mm. It was more of a, of a um, diary. You know, I couldn't see it, but I was struggling with some issues, if you will, because right. it was I was more to the truth and not to what you see today uh, on the screen. Yeah. And so I hired a, um, a Hollywood script consultant, uh, Marilyn Horowitz, out of uh, NYU, New York. She and I began to work on the story and, and flesh it out. Uh, she gave me some wonderful feedback and, and uh, 
we began to really work on the, um, as I said, the, the, the character development and the narrative and uh, really put together a, um, had to take out a lot of the truth and, and, and use uh, mm. creative liberties, <laughs> Hollywood liberties, <laughs> right. frankly, and come up with some fictitious things that made a more telling narrative but yet stayed true right. to the essence of the story. So I was really inspired um, to tell this story uh, after, unfortunately, my, uh, my wife passed. Mm. Um, and uh, the original concept, it was, again, based on a play right. that my pastor had written by the name Nocturnal Agony. Um, however, the, this adaptation is a true adaptation. It's really uh, totally different from the play itself. As it began to evolve, as I just stated, um, I had to really uh, change a lot to tell a uh, compelling story and, and not tell, um, you know, a, a book. <laughs> yeah, you know. right, definitely. And I mean, you know, yeah. we just talked about uh, Argo and all the President's Men, and it's uh, mm -hmm. the same thing. I'm, I, it might mm -hmm. not have, uh, you know, some of uh, the serious elements that your film has, mm -hmm. but, you know, taking those liberties to entertain, right. right, the masses, but at the same time keeping it true to, as you said, you know, the, the, the underlying story and the underlying yes. message. Yes. Um, uh, you know, you have an ensemble cast uh, mm -hmm. in this film, right? And I know, as you said, you have uh, some uh, old, you know, cast members yes. from uh, To Save that show up in the yes, film. Yes. Um, and as you said, also, you have Lawrence Hilton Jacobs and uh, Renee uh, Watson. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about that, right? For the, the director that's watching and, you know, uh, wants to get to the next level. Mm -hmm. You know, as a director, um, you know, sometimes that, that could make, that would make me nervous. You mm -hmm. know, what, mm -hmm. what am I going to tell him? <laughs> how, did, <laughs> how did you approach that in your directing? You know, how do you work with your actors? Well, the, the first thing I like to, to start off about is, is to talk about why we went after um, certain names such as this. When we uh, had two saved on the festival circuit, uh, my producer and, and I, um, Mary Colbert, we began to find a, a lot, get a lot of feedback that, hey, Brother Shueb, I love this movie. Right. I, I would love to program it on X Network, yeah. X Cable, but it doesn't have anybody in it. <laughs> I don't know these people. Right. I was like, well, what does that have to do with anything, you know? And so we began to see, that, okay, you're going to have to, in order to, as you talked about, go to the next level, um, you're going to have to package right. your, your movie right. with certain elements, uh, stars that you believe that you can get for a certain financial package that would fit within your budget. I mean, obviously you can't get Halle Berry or, or <laughs> I couldn't, you know, right. get, get Den Denzel for the movie. <laughs> But you couldn't? <clears throat> no. <laughs> <laughs> Wish they could. <laughs> right. If you know them, give them, tell them to give me a call. <laughs> I'll, I'll holler at them. Okay, you. holler at them for me. But, uh, uh, but I think that what the film director wants to do is to begin to look at someone who may be, what I try to do is get people who had the hunger or I could see that they could really use this vehicle to either resurrect their career, mm. similar to what uh, Quentin Tarantino did with you know, both Reservoir Dogs and, you know, yeah. Pulp Fiction. Right, right. You know, we resurrected the, the careers, you know, of John Travolta very well. And Samuel really got his shot. Yeah, definitely. Took his <laughs> career to a new level. Yeah. And so we were looking for people just as, just like that. And um, obviously, the first person we approached was uh, Renee Watson. I had two people in mind. I had the young lady who uh, starred in Rock. I don't know if you remember the, oh, yeah, 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 with Charles Dutton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was considering her uh -huh. um, and I and, and Vernay Watson. Okay. And so um, actually it's literally almost a flip of a coin. I, I had both uh, of their agents' information before me when I began the process, and Vernay just happened to be first. Right. Her agent uh, responded immediately, and we began negotiating from there. Okay. From there it began to propel. We had a number of... Um, stars, I won't name their names at the moment, that actually had signed on to the project. Mm. We originally, when I wrote the script, I had a major, I mean a major um, R&B star mm. that would star as Patty, the, the woman okay. in the film. Right. She, she signed a LOI and we thought we had a deal, but, uh. <laughs> but you know, as Hollywood goes. Right. Somehow when the film was uh, written, when I had the script, sent it to her agent, she um, got amnesia, said, I don't remember this project. Mm, wow, wow. <laughs> and so we had to, to, <laughs> to table that. Yeah. And uh, went on to, to, to pursue um, the other people. Um, 
a, it, mm-hmm. obviously it's a you know a lot to to deal with um, yes. uh, as a director. You know, it's the highs and lows. Uh, but obviously, for um, you know the characters that you have, uh, you know the name Hezekiah Walker. You know, people that we know. Um, they obviously looked at the script. They said, you know, there's something about this I want to sign on. And uh, specifically, you know, we we, we look at, uh, you know, some of the deeper uh, topics uh, that are covered. Uh, But I think you did a really good job of not just showing, uh, you know, the pain and the torment, but also the healing aspect. Um, so talk a little bit about that, especially as you said, you know, in, in African-American communities, sometimes, you know, bipolar disorder, you know, what's that? Or, you know, it's something that you're not really going to talk about. But um, just talk about that in terms of the, the, the healing aspect of, of the film as well. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Kevin, because in my opinion, um, the movie um, is not effective without redemption and healing. Um, if you simply talk about uh, someone drugging, uh, and, and don't uh, deal with why, what's the root cause of, of their behavior. And, or you simply talk about the behavior and not talk about that there's hope, though. Right. There's healing. That's what makes it a worthwhile endeavor. To me, the film is, I don't want to do a film that simply um, states facts, if you will. We all, we all know that there are people who are addicted to drugs. We all know right. that there are people who may be suffering from uh, mental illness and bipolar disorder in particular. But many of us don't know the root reasons. Yeah. We don't know the causes. Yeah. And particularly in the African American community, we, we do things, as you know, such as, oh, that girl just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't pay her. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> right, right, right. And, you know? <laughs> but in the reality, is, is this is a very serious phenomenon, and it's an issue that affects everyone. Yeah. And so that's why I insisted upon, or wrote it in that way, that there be healing and redemption at the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, quite frankly, we've gotten a lot of, or some, from the Hollywood establishment that they want the film to be shorter. Mm. And I'm like, the the whole third act is is about healing and redemption. The first two acts move along quickly. It's rapid. It's very Hollywoodian, if you will. It's it's, it's very formulaic. It moves just like a no, but the last act stops and it begins to work more like an independent, very, uh, you know, in a traditional independent film. And I think that, I don't want to lose that. Right. I don't want to lose that because I think that's where people are going to be touched most right well, there. Really quickly, uh, you know, the film has opened up uh, for numerous festivals. Yes. Um, what's the status now? Uh, I know you have a campaign going on. If you can just quickly just tell us a sure. little bit. Sure. Well, very quickly, we are planning to release the film. We already have... Um, a uh, distributor in place mm-hmm. to release the film in theaters across the country. It'll be uh, probably in theaters this fall. And we are raising um, capital um, to assist in the marketing of that, the advertising dollars. As you know, these things are extremely ex- expensive, and we don't have a distributor that has deep pockets. Right. So we're going to have to assist, if not pay for, the advertising mm-hmm. but, uh, and, and getting it into the, those theaters. But in terms of booking it, scheduling it, putting it in the theaters, that's already taken care of for okay. us. Wow. So what we have established is a fundraising campaign on uh, Indiegogo. Mm-hmm. That is I-N-D-I-E-G-O-G-O. Yeah. Indiegogo.com. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you can uh, go to that site and click on Nocturnal Agony and it will come up. We have okay. a number of prizes that, we'll, uh, that we're offering. But anyone can contribute um, as low as $1. Wow. Anyone can contribute and help out in this cause because we really need the, um, uh, the, 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 I would say the organizations that deal with some of these issues, and the, the national uh, health organizations, mental health organizations, uh, addiction organizations to come and be a part of this because I think that there, as I said before, there's no film that is championing these causes mm-hmm. out there in the marketplace. Awesome. And so, yes. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> Well, uh, Shweb, thank you so much for coming on the show, man, just sharing your story. Thank uh, you. Nocturnal Agony, uh, nocturnalagonythemovie.com. Yeah, uh, that's right. De- definitely looking forward to seeing that. In uh, theaters this fall. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> my man. Thank you, my boy. I appreciate you. <laughs> 
that's all for this episode, folks. I'd like to thank my guests, WTOP's Jason Fraley and DC's own Schwabe Mitchell for coming on the show. You can check out uh, Jason on WTOP 103.5 Friday mornings at 40 past the hour on the odds. Uh, and again, nocturnalagonythemovie.com to uh, check out Mr. Mitchell's film, uh, Nocturnal Agony. Until next time, I hope you stay locked on film.